Slept on Cinema is sponsored by Training Ties, the ultimate shoe tying tool. If you know someone who's struggling with shoe tying for any reason, Training Ties is the perfect solution. James Caan is good as the heavy, but the movie degenerates into routine comic book mayhem. A film that didn't need too much effort to be erased from viewers' memories. Arnold looks tired. Even by action movie standards, this is a soulless recital of formula. Extremely predictable and derivative. The middling result, diverting while it lasts, but too silly to recommend, is merely this week's Funhouse action pick. Welcome to this week's episode of Slept On Cinema. I'm your host, Stan Steamer. I'm Grobe Street. This week we're getting into the 1996 thriller classic, Eraser. I can't wait to get into this. As always, the criteria for our podcast is that movies must be below 50% on Rotten Tomatoes, both for critics and audiences. The podcast is structured so that the first half is spoiler-free, We go through some things to look for in the movie, take a break. You can go watch the movie, come back, and we talk about what we just went through. Nice bonus. This one's available for free on Netflix right now. Perfect. Uh, Why don't we get into the rotten premise? Do it. John the Eraser Kruger is the top gun in the U.S. Martial Witness Protection Scheme. He erases their past and deals with their future. His latest assignment is whistleblower Dr. Lee Cullen who has evidence against a major arms corporation that's selling weapons to terrorists with the collusion of rogue enemy agents within. But there is danger near a home for Kruger from within his own department. Critics, 40%. Audience, 39% somehow. That makes no sense. That makes absolutely no sense. This movie is made for the audience, certainly not for critics. I I have no idea how it's... I mean, it's basically the same, but it's still lower for the audience than for critics. That doesn't make any sense. Right. You could have convinced me that it was like five ninety five, and I would have been like, yeah, that sounds about right. Absolutely. Yep. As long as that audience score was at least over 80. Yes. I've talked to a bunch of people about the movie this this, this week when talking about what, what movie we're doing in the pod. And every single person I talked to was just like, oh, hell yeah. Eraser is awesome. I love that movie. This is just like some of the other movies we've done, uh, like Lake Placid and Jeepers Creepers, where like anyone you talk to who actually saw it have great memories of watching this movie. I remember seeing this movie in the theater, and there's a couple scenes that are just like you can't forget. This is a great litmus test to see if you're watching movies with the right people. If someone around you can't suspend disbelief for this Arnold movie in the mid-90s, it's an action movie about a, a futuristic gun that couldn't actually exist, and they they... they poke holes in the movie and say, oh, that's ridiculous. It'd be more hurt here or that could never happen. This is great to watch this movie with them because now you know these these aren't the people to be watching movies with. Absolutely. I, it, it's also probably a litmus test to whether you should uh, be listening to this podcast. If, if you didn't have a good time watching this movie, you're probably not going to have a good time listening to our podcast. We are not the podcast for you if you did not enjoy this movie. We did enjoy it. And uh, I, I ended up, this is, so funny, we do these movies, and sometimes I watch the movie, like, you know, two or three times, but I think I hit four. It took us a couple, like, an extra week, but I think I hit four, four and a half times, and I just gave it a quick, like, three times rewatch before the pod. It is just a fun movie. Yeah, it's great. Highly, highly rewatchable. Every time, I'm just like, oh, yes, this scene's about to come up. This scene's about to come up. And it, it well, I'm sure we'll get into this later, but it is one of these just action-packed movies where scene after scene after scene is amazing. All right, some some background on the film came out June 21, 1996. Number one opening weekend. No surprise there. This is the perfect movie to come out to start, kick off a, a summer blockbuster series. It brought in $24.5 million its first weekend in 1996, which is a lot of money. That's that's big bucks. We need to start um, getting, once we, once we start blowing up and have like a production team, there needs to be some sort of sound bike because so many of our movies are number one in the box office when they come out, and yet somehow they make our podcast. And, and I would say this is even like a like a number one with an exclamation point because it beat out a opening weekend of a Disney movie. This movie came in one ahead of Hunchback of Notre Dame, which is a Disney movie on its first weekend. So that's like not only did it come out number one, but it, it had some stiff competition. Those D- Disney okay. movies are hard to take down. This is like the team that won a championship but had to go through the gauntlet 
Like you didn't, they didn't just have a, a layup championship by coming in number one. Going up against a Disney movie is is a death sentence. And yeah, on its opening it's weekend, cool. it's almost impossible. And it, it was also just one of these great times to be a movie fan because The Rock was also out. The first Mission Impossible also out. Twister, and then one of my favorites, The Phantom, also out all at that same time. So you could just I think, spend I think an entire week. Independence Day is lurking around this time as well, too. Yeah, I think what? It must have come out a little while after this, right? Yeah, yep. But that's crazy. I do remember going to the theaters a lot that year, so that makes sense. And it made a bunch of money. It, it pulled in $101 million domestic, $242 million worldwide, and that's $96. So we're we're talking big bucks. That's why that's why Arnold gets the $25 million for the movie, because he always just crushes the worldwide audience. Oh, yeah. I mean, and this is a Arnold movie. This is very much an Arnold movie. It's fantastic. So I, I think you don't you don't need to know a whole lot about the background here really to get into this movie. But I thought it'd be worthwhile just to dig into the witness protection program a little bit. Because I feel like this is always in movies. And I'm always just like, is this real? Is this even really a thing? And it is. The formal name is Witness Security Program. People call it WITSEC, just like just like you'll see in the film. Operated by the U.S. Marshals just like you'll see in the film. Formally established 1970. They, they put this in place to combat organized crime. At the time, they had no way of really taking down the mob because their reach was so big. You know, if someone flipped, they'd go out and mess with their whole family. So they needed a way that they could get people to, to flip on the mob. So they created this system run by the marshals where they would give people entirely new identities it's a federal government so they would give you new social security new new birth certificate move you to a brand new place give you a brand new name and this is all real this comes up in movies but this is real apparently since the program started they've they've done this with over twenty thousand people so there's twenty thousand new identities 95 percent of which are actual criminals because usually it's the people that are flipping have been somehow involved in whatever the enterprise is this movie, I think, is one of those interesting things because it, it finds that 5% of uh, non-criminal people who still need protection. Makes sense. Um, they, make it a little, they make it a point. This isn't a spoiler, but they make it a point to let you know there's a good person that's being saved. And it's probably because of that fact. People are like, oh, she's a witness protection person. Odds are she's a crook. No, of course, Vanessa Williams could not be a crook. Interesting fact. Uh, or two interesting facts here. One, they do usually make people keep their first name, which I guess makes sense so that when someone says, "Oh, hey, 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 Grobe," you're you're responding. It's not, uh, you know, your, your name's not suddenly Steve, and you're not responding, and then suddenly your cover's blown. And two, I mean, my my wife and I, I forget the movie, but we just watched the movie, and they changed, they kept the first name of the person and changed the last. Oh, I wish I could remember the movie, but we had a discussion like, why would that make sense? And we came to that conclusion that because when you're quickly called by a first name, you have to have that reaction of like, okay, yeah. I heard the name. And you don't want it to, you know, raise your head when somebody else's name is called, even though it's right. Direct. Exactly. Suddenly, yeah. suddenly your cover's blown, and you know you're getting tortured by the mob. <laughs> Other last last fun fact here: up until the 1990s, they also used to pay for plastic surgery to change your appearance if that was something you were interested in. Ooh, but, real face off. Yeah. If you go into which? real real. I mean, I don't know about face off, but real <laughs> face uh, different. That's crazy. That's uh, well. That's back when Congress wasn't involved. I guess when they had that, they were throwing that money around. Back in the good old days. Yeah, exactly. Wow, great facts. I, uh, I always Witsec comes up in so many movies, but rarely is it explored as it is. Right, you're always kind of like, is this even real? The first movie. What's the first movie you can remember them talking about someone going into Witsec? I mean, in my I mind, was- it's always this movie. In my mind, like this is the Witsec <laughs> movie for me. So I, I have trouble thinking of anything else. I think I have Goodfellas, and then there's a bunch of there's a gap, and then there's this. Want to get to Bolo? Let's do it. Uh, Bolo the Mob. Love it. I'm going to say Bolo Alka Seltzer. <laughs> I think that's the second time Alka Seltzer has made a Bolo. I like that. I, th- I think you're right, and it is a very uh, different uh, circumstance this time. Yes, very very different. Uh, Bolo items that are in the opening credits being used later on in the movie. Ooh, that's a great one. <laughs> this is, I guess, kind of similar. Same, same, same vein here. I'm going to say Bolo foreshadowing. 
if anything comes up, it <laughs> might be foreshadowing. Just keep that in mind. There's a lot of it. Yep. Bolo guitar riffs. I'll be on the listen for. <laughs> I'll, I'll follow that right up with another be on the listen for. Bolo, a bird call. Oh, great one. Bolo, I don't know if you ever did this, but Bolo sitting in the middle of the front of a car. Happened a lot <laughs> in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Not so much anymore. Yeah, they don't they don't make those bench seats like they used to. Nope. <laughs> I'm going to say Bolo, and this is a, a great thing that happens in movies all the time. Bolo, a gun in your desk drawer. It's If you're a villain in the 90s, you need a gun in your, dress, your, your, your desk drawer for sure. Bolo, luggage. Great one. <laughs> great one. Uh, I'm going to say Bolo. This this took me a few watches, but after after I noticed this, I watched it a number of times. Bolo, a very fast two minutes. There's a time we're watching the clock and two minutes goes by exceptionally fast. <laughs> uh, Bolo, Italian stereotypes. No shortage. <laughs> All right, I'm going to go. This is a this is a triple Bolo. A triple Whoa. Bolo. Unique weapons. We got a freezer weapon, a desk chair weapon, and a crocodile weapon. Wow, great ones. Well, I'll cross all those off my list. I like that you combine those. Uh, Bolo mini laser discs. Love those. They really still bring seem, back to the 90s. But they still seem futuristic to me. They do. <laughs> I feel like it's especially when they're so small. Yep, exactly. All right, I got another another triple bolo here. This is a, wow. a triple bolo of um, some really great cameos, um, and they're in varying degrees. But there are three of them. One hard hard to miss. You will not miss. But John Slattery, early John Slattery from Mad Men. You will see him. Very young, great great actor, great guy. Easy to see bolo John Slattery, and the other two, I think, are tougher to see. But Bolo... Can I, guess, can I guess them? Oh, yeah. Let's have it. Uh, I have Billy Bedlam from Con Air and Boggs from Shawshank. Those are great because those are not even the two I'm going with. So this is oh. a, 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 a quintuple Bolo. <laughs> wow. So so many, so many cameos here. The, the other two I had was Bolo Cameron Manheim. She is... I, I didn't even really know her name, but she is the woman in the Before? practice. Okay. Yep. Gotcha. Uh, she pops up for just just a uh, I don't even know less than a minute. So that's a that's a good one to keep to, to Bolo. The other one and this one is a great one for the pod. If if you're a longtime listener, you may be familiar with this man, but only probably if you're a longtime listener. Gerald Burns, the actor who plays Jeff Gregg in the Net, also makes an appearance here. Central oh. character in the Net, who wow. you only see for about five seconds on TV in the net, despite him being talked about constantly, does make an appearance here. Yeah, he big role, even though he didn't get a lot of screen time in the net. Yeah, it's like, it was a big name role. It was like, oh yeah, Jeff Gregg, but I could not uh, have painted a picture of him. <laughs> nope. That's a great pull. Wow, so many uh, henchmen or other movie Bolo guys in this movie. Um, I'll go Bolo, a game of chicken. Ooh, I like it. I'm going to go Bolo, and this is just classic product placement, but Bolo, an AT&T phone. <laughs> you know what decade you're in when you see AT&T. Bolo, sleaze being burnt off of Arnold to reveal his muscles. I love that. and it, it, it almost takes too long for that to happen. Way too long. He covers those things up for too much of the movie. Yep. But when they come out, it's fantastic. Oh, they pop. <laughs> uh, this is my last Bolo, but this is... My favorite type of elevator door, Bolo, the type of elevator door that open from the top and the bottom. I don't know if that has a name. It's very industrial. I love those. Whenever that pops up in the movie, just feed me those elevator doors. Yeah, that seems like right in your wheelhouse for sure. Uh, I'll rattle off a couple more here. This movie, like a lot of our good movies, just has so many things to be on the lookout for. Uh, Bolo drill bits. Bolo, a very large wire. Uh, seems like it's out of the seventies. You'd think that the feds would come a little bit farther in the, uh, yeah. <laughs> in the creative. Almost like it. They wanted it to be found. Seemed like it. You draw attention with a, a brooch that size. Uh, Bolo, a very windy twenty fifth floor, and let's see. Bolo, hiding behind a plant for cover in a gunfight. 
<laughs> and Bolo, a perfect dismount from Arnold. Love it. <laughs> Love it. Uh, this movie is a lot of fun. Yeah, so many I, things to watch out for. So much, just nonstop action. This is, I, I want to, I mean, I, I guess we will. I want to go watch it right now. <laughs> They'll have their chance to after we figure out what drink everyone should have while watching this movie. I have a feeling we could have overlapped on this, but let's have you go first and see if your movie, I mean, if your drink to pair with this movie is the same. I'm, I'm guessing we don't. Um, oh, okay. Nice. And I, I am saying, first off, the drink to pair with this movie is definitely not bottled water. That's for damn sure. That's for sure. Uh, so I'm going to go here with a Gruner Veltliner. It's the, the number one wine produced in Austria. And wow. it's, it's a great bang for your buck, tons of flavor, and most importantly, it's Austrian. I mean, this movie is a, is a Arnold movie, and I just wanted to pay tribute to my main man, Arnold, and I think the best way to do that is to drink a classic wine from his home country, that is full of flavor. It's not some hoity-toity wine. Great bang for your buck. Very refreshing. Just crack open a, a Grunewaldiner and enjoy. That's phenomenal. This is, I think, his Arnold's second appearance on our podcast, and I doubt it'll be his last. So maybe every time we have an Arnold, Arnold movie, pop open one of his Austrian red. Is, is it a red? It's a white. It's a white. It's a white? Okay. Yeah, pop open the Austrian white and uh, enjoy yourself. That's a, that's a great pick. I like the little homage to uh, to uh, to Arnold. Mine, I thought would be um, picked by you too, but I'm glad it wasn't because that I think your choice is amazing. I, I picked uh, we're a little on the nose, but the Mind Eraser, popular in the '80s. It was, oh, nice. a, it was a, a boozy caffeinated cocktail of uh, two ounces of coffee liqueur. You drizzle two ounces of vodka on top, and then a little squirt of club soda chilled to top it. Uh, it's not, I've never had it. It sounds terrible. Uh, oh, this is this is. I think this is the second. Uh, this is our second Mind Eraser movie. This also, really? I, I had paired the um, paycheck. Oh, that's right. Yeah. it's wow. a classic. They're they're delicious, and you also are supposed to drink them with a straw, so you can drink them as fast as possible. I did see that. Yeah, this doesn't seem like something you would sip. You want to get this in your system. No, as you fast as you possible. just get it. You get it down. <laughs> They're great. All right, had one. great choices. One I love it. I did. I completely forgot that we picked that for paycheck. I'm glad we did, though. Uh, all right, this is your chance to uh, go watch the movie, and we'll see you on the other side. Enjoy. He works for a secret government agency. He answers to no one. He is called in when time has run out to save your life. He must eliminate every trace of your existence. A body may be found, but it won't be yours. Because to protect your future, he will erase your past. Arnold Schwarzenegger. Relax. You've been erased. Eraser. Slept on Cinema is brought to you by Training Ties, the ultimate shoe tying tool. If you know anyone who's struggling with shoe tying, Training Ties is the perfect solution. Or if you know anyone who just doesn't like tying their shoes, Training Ties keeps shoes tied all day long. Say no to Velcro and yes to independence with Training Ties. Welcome back. What a ride. So much fun. That movie is the perfect movie for our podcast. I'm not sure I can think of another movie where it's just action scene followed by action scene followed by action scene followed by a tiny little bit of like dialogue followed by another awesome action scene the dialogue is just some exposition time so you understand a little bit more what's going on and then we're right back to action yep i can't wait to get to this you got the first pick in our draft what do you got so i there's just so many things to to pick here and it's tough not to pick arnold cuz i love arnold and this is a, just such an arnold vehicle but I'm going with the guns. The guns in this movie were what I remembered. When I thought of this movie, when we talked about doing this movie, I was just like, <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Those guns were so cool. 
Like I can't wait to watch this again. And those guns were those guns were cool in 1996 when technology in terms of special effects was a little rocky in for the most part. But these guns, not only did they look cool when they were shot with this sort of like green plasma stuff going on, but it had the the seeing through walls, seeing into the person's beating heart in that early scene. That was just so cool. I, I can't imagine taking anything else. We could go on. The guns is the perfect choice of this one because that they, they even build it up too, where it's like the smallest one was only ever on a battleship. And now it's yeah. like these small ones and... By the end of the movie, Arnold has two of them on his on his arms. Oh, yeah. It's just incredible. It's used so well because it's not even just a gun. They modded out the guns. They don't even talk about the fact that it can like see it has like x-ray vision, and like you said, it can see someone's heart. That's aside from the fact that the bullets travel at the speed of light and right. uh, it's aluminum rounds that you never have to reload. It's like if you just invented a gun off the top of your head, that would be the coolest gun. They did it. They made it. Yeah. So cool. Yeah, that scene that scene with Arnold wielding two of them, you know, you knew we were headed there from the get go. And yeah. you just, when it finally hit, it was well worth it. Yeah, and it was right when he was going through that warehouse and you know, he dropped into that pit of fire and you know, is he dead? The, the Billy Bedlam was talking about it. They must have even killed all the roaches in there. There's no chance that any survived, and of course he does, and ends up two seconds later with his sleeves cut off and holding two massive cannons. But that's a great first pick. I think because this we're recording this a little bit after uh, he passed, uh, I think you gotta t- I gotta take James Caan in this movie. He is just love that pick. He's so I, good. He's so good in everything. He's just I, I I don't know how it keeps happening, but we just watch Misery again, and it's just like made laying in a bed uh, as a writer an incredible, exciting movie, and him being the heavy in this, like from the moment he walks on the screen and. You can, he says, based, they allude to him being the mentor of Arnold. You're just like, oh, he's going to double cross Arnold. It's James Caan. He's not going to be the good guy in this. And it's okay <laughs> that you know from the moment he steps on screen that he's going to be the bad guy. He does it so well. He's such a, a jerk. That scene where he's with, he's like passing off Vanessa Williams to some other guy. And he's like, I don't care what you do with her. Do whatever you want to her. Oh, he's yeah. just awful, but great villain in this movie. Oh, yeah. He he just adds that, you know, I guess you call it sort of gravitas. He adds something to this movie that takes it from just being a, a popcorn summer action flick with Arnold to, to something. He just elevates the whole thing. Like that performance that he's just so evil, but also so sort of like corporate and just like, oh, it's just business, but just like so evil is great. Like when he when he. Uh, offs that young agent on the plane so casually and it's just like again it's just like it's just business he was just amazing he does it better than anyone I think his like casual awful deeds that he does in movies he can just shoot some guy and be like "Eh." he just gives one little shrug and a James Conn little like eye lift and mouth lift and he's like well that it just happened whatever and you just move past it and I gotta take his I didn't I almost took his hair as a separate choice but (laughs) Uh, we'll loop it into <laughs> to just him in general. Losing his hair in The Godfather, by this time, he's got a great mane of hair. I also loved his move on the, on the plane when he when he shoots that young agent. And he very casually puts the uh, bulletproof vest on the seat behind him right before he has the guy sit down so that, obviously, he knows he can't shoot a gun on an airplane that the bullet could go through the body and suddenly we're all, you know, fuselage is ripped open and whatnot. And putting that bulletproof vest behind him was just a, a, a genius move. I like to think that that was James Caan that did that. It wasn't written that's in. I'm, I don't know that for a fact, but I am positive that that's what, what happened. That he just said, no, 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 we get, let me fix this. And he probably just improvised that. Absolutely. That's very James Caan asked to uh, improvise that. It's unfortunate that just a few moments later, there's like 50 rounds of gunshots going off within that, that plane. <laughs> so, yeah, it really, it really uh, I guess, didn't matter in the long term, but uh, <laughs> still. <laughs> still, yeah, he was careful and aware. Uh, so I got to go with James Conn there in my second round pick. Uh, we just talked about it, so it's hard for me to pick, but uh, there's more to it. That scene on the airplane. Um, oh, yeah. I guess I James mean, Conn. I, 
I was going to take that next if you didn't. It's, it's impossible amazing. not to take that. I just watched Gray Man, which came out on Netflix, and they have an awesome like skydiving scene. Um, and it just feels like an homage to this movie where you could totally. they even show like his brain work, working when he's hanging on to the edge of the plane, being like, okay, I got to get the pack. I have to l- drop my gun. How am I going to do this? And he's able to do everything. It's slightly He threw the chair at an angle, you know, that messed up the plane. But mm-hmm. when he dropped off and he went after the parachute, he avoided the engine, which is really impressive. But that whole scene in general was just an incredible scene. And the same sort of wind power coming from that, from that plane as being, you know, the gunshot on the 25th floor um, in the beginning. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that scene just goes on and on. It just like gets better and better and better. And you're finally like, all right. He's like out of this plane, like this is so wild. He goes out of that parachute, catches the parachute. And you're like, all right, like that was crazy. I can't believe how awesome that scene was. And then you get the plane steering around to come and try to, it's not run him over, but like fly him over, I guess. I think it was to, to squash him like a bug on squash the windshield. Him like a, exactly, on the windshield. And then you get him firing into the cockpit. I mean, it's just like, it just gets... It gets better and better and better till I, I can't imagine a better action movie scene. That's just the pinnacle of action movie scenes. Yeah, and then he has to fight with the parachute as he's falling down, barely gets it open in time, and then there's that oh, great – uh, I don't know if you'll pick – we have Superto later on, but the Welcome to Earth line, uh, might as well just say it. Oh, it's great. amazing. It's great by the little girl. Yep. <laughs> amazing. I don't know if there's another movie – like there's, it happens sometimes where a great action hero will shoot through a car that's about to hit them. But I don't know how many times a plane is about has been about to hit some someone and they're shooting through the windshield and they take the plane down in that game of chicken. I'm not sure I've seen that in another movie. I can't think of one. I mean it's, it's probably tough to top this. So it's probably like if you're going to take something off the pedestal, it's, it's a tall task. <laughs> An unbelievable scene. Great, great pick. Great scene. I would have taken that next for sure. I'm going to follow this up with, and that was sort of a a great pick of a scene that you do see. I'm going to go with the scenes you don't see. I thought they did a great job here of, of skipping over the stuff that we just don't care about, right? So coming to mind from that scene, we don't see how the plane lands i don't care how the plane lands it was probably a bumpy landing but whatever they're professionals they can land a plane that's been shot at and the door has been ripped open and people have been murdered inside i don't need to see that i just i will trust that it will get down also arnold escaping cyrex after that whole chase through the building they're up on the roof the helicopter takes off and then you kind of just cut to the two of them Arnold and uh, what's his name driving away from from the scene, and I, I didn't need to see them coming out of there. I think that was a perfect skip over, right? Like we know they get out, they they got up to the top, they could get all the way back down, but we kind of already saw it. And I thought they did a, a great job of not showing some of that to us and just moving the movie along with great pace. So I'm going to go with the scenes you didn't see. Yeah, the editing of this. I wonder if they even filled some of these scenes. They were just like. It's going to be too long, and they were smart enough to know that they didn't. They didn't want to crack an hour and fifty minutes for this action movie. You don't want to have like a two hour and ten minute movie. So they did a perfect job of editing out some of these scenes. I also liked how they just used one line to uh, talk about how the reporter that uh, Vanessa Williams was going to go to with that copy. They're like, "Oh no, she's dead." Like we didn't have to see the home invasion and the kill. They just just one yep. lampshade line to be like, "Oh no, that's we already got her." Yeah, it's perfect. And it's perfect. It keeps it moving along, keeps it a tidy, just under two hours, as as the action movie should be. It's just great. Yeah, that's a great choice. So my third pick here, I'm going to go with the computers. I thought the computers here were so cool. Like the, the first one pops up, it's probably not as memorable, but when Arnold is in the the marshal's office and he's talking to James Conn. He has this computer that has these sort of stack looking things that are just moving up and down as he's typing away and changing people's identity and dental records. And I don't know what that is. I've never seen a computer that, that has these, but it was, I was just like, I saw that and I was like, this is an awesome computer. This computer can probably do anything. That was so cool. And then they go and just blow that computer out of the water. When Vanessa Williams is in the, 
uh, Cyrex building and trying to copy those disks. And you get this thing with the spinning arms and it's taking the disks out. The computers were just so cool. They made me completely convinced that the technology was top of the line, everything because of how mechanical it all was. Yeah, we've um, had some great computer scenes in our movies, but this is this is up there for sure. It was also crazy. I, I hadn't realized that that this was out at the same time as Mission Impossible because the scene where she's copying those discs is so so similar to that Mission Impossible scene that everyone remembers. So you could have had a double feature in the theater that weekend and just seen two of the greatest computer disc copying scenes of all time. I mean, if I were to name the top two that have existed, I mean, I guess the net would be on there too. So it's a top right. three. Yep. Um, those would all be, those would all be the the ones for sure. Yeah. And it's so funny to see such high level uh, computer programming at like a government agency. It's, it's, it's like, it's like the money that went into uh, last action hero, the, the police stations there and how much, <laughs> how much, excess they have for everything like that same budget sort of got transferred here they have so much money to throw around with these great programs like you said of just like drag and drop of dental records from one person to the other and it's just super accessible great computers in this movie that's a great choice this is tough um actually no it's not this is an easy pick for me the the crocodile scene i think they're crocodiles or they alligators do we know i i don't remember whatever yeah but I, I assume crocodiles because he would have said like later alligator if they, if they <laughs> won't. Uh, so that crocodile scene, that's the scene I remember from seeing it as a kid is just oh, yeah. out of nowhere you have these like – these are some some badass henchmen. And one of them was uh, – was it Dobbs from Shawshank? And that scene where they all get unleashed, I think there were more kills from the gators in this than there were in Lake Placid. They just destroyed the whole crew. And then once they've served their purpose, Arnold, you know, shoots one and be- becomes luggage, another great li- one-liner. And it was just a great, great scene overall. Uh, vicious Crocs in this one. I love, too, how you could sort of, you saw the the gears turning in Arnold's head of like, how yeah. am I going to get out of this? And you just, you sort of pan over to the the tank and you're just like, oh, hell yeah. And you, you, yeah. you sort of, it becomes very obvious what's going to happen before it happens. And you just, you just like can't wait for it to become unleashed. And when it's unleashed, it, it meets the moment. It surpass- yeah, it surpasses expectation when they're released. Yeah. And I saw so many bad reviews where it's like, oh, the CGI in this movie was so bad, especially the, you know, the alligator scene or whatever. And I couldn't disagree more. Like, I, what? Yeah, I, I thought it was awesome. And they even had like slow pauses where they they had the CGI one, and then they also put like the body double in there and ripped the arm off. It wasn't yep. just all CGI. It was a nice combination. So I thought that scene was incredible. I love that scene. It's a great scene. It's proof of, of how how many just great scenes this movie had. I mean, it was just a like amazing scene after amazing scene after amazing scene. It's I like when action movies are just like you have a bunch of you know the people who are writing it probably having a bunch of. Uh, mind erasers and probably some some drugs and they're just sitting in a room come up with like crazy scenarios that would put that'd be awesome to put Arnold in where it's like ah let's have him shoot a tank of alligators and to help him kill the bad guys let's have him play chicken with a an airplane let's have him dive after a parachute and they just make a movie around it that's awesome what more do I want right it's amazing there's no fluff in this movie (laughs) um uh, my sleeper pick I love it when someone is like a sniper and they, they're looking through their lens and they look at somebody else who also was looking through their lens of the gun, but they are just a hair late and the bullet goes through like the lens and hits them in the eye. That's yep. always an incredible scene. And you know, like so the evil guy had the rail gun and he was like, Oh, I gotcha. Too late. The, uh, the mobster sniper had him in his sights. Yep. No, I love that too. That's always that's sort of a, a classic. You're like, oh, nope, you got got. Yeah, it makes you think like they're ahead of the game, but really they've been up behind. Yeah, it's definitely also one of those ones that sort of like draws you into the movie whenever you're seeing through that point of view, which is awesome. For my sleeper pick, and I, I feel like I probably didn't see this until recently, but if you're looking in the credits for Arnold's character, it doesn't have his name. It just says eraser 
and I just love that. It doesn't have uh, it doesn't have Dylan Kruger. It just says Eraser Arnold Schwarzenegger. How can you one up on the credits and they find a way to do it? It's subtle, wow. but it's it's subtle. they found a way to make even yeah even the credits exciting. Great draft. Let's move on to our superlative this week, which is uh, favorite one liner. And there there are a lot of great one liners in this, but my guess is that we're both going to have the same favorite because there's in, in my mind one is just head and shoulders above the rest. I have eleven written down, but one circled. So let's see if he yeah. chooses. <laughs> yeah, it's it, it's for me. It's got to be your luggage. The fact, like he's looking oh, okay. at the alligator. Yeah. He's looking at the alligator and just goes, your luggage, and then blasts him away. I, whenever they thought that lineup, I'm sure whoever, they just like high-fived for like 20 yeah. minutes for that. Yeah, that's a career-defining moment, high-five, for sure. That was a great, great line. Um, that's not what I had circled, but also, but a great one. Nice. I had, so uh, the, like, there was a creepy guy after after Murphy Brown's fling. He saved him and his wife. And a guy is about to close the van door and goes, smile, you've just been erased. It's so just on the nose and awesome. And it lets you know more about this movie, how it's going to be going forward. I, I thought that that line was awesome. Yeah, I love that line. And I remember watching it again, just being shocked that it wasn't Arnold delivering that line for the first time. But I like that. It sort of just showed that this is not like, it's not just him. There are other people in this in this program. Um, honorable mention. I have uh, when he's when Billy Bedlam is trying to is giving him a little guff there, uh, and they has he hasn't been outed as um, you know being corrupt. Uh, Don't you ever get tired of babysitting scum? Yeah, but in your case, I'll make an exception. And he's so yep. angry afterwards that, that yep. Arnold just got him. I awesome. had that one too. <laughs> I also liked. Um... When when Arnold's sort of late to pick up Vanessa Williams at the zoo, and she's like, "You're late," and he just says, "Traffic." <laughs> and I'm like, that's kind of a reference to him driving that truck into the zoo, but it's also him getting almost run over by an airplane. It's so much just traffic. But it's so not like he, he can just sum up this crazy scene with just like, "Man, this is just another day for me." So I had I had yep. some traffic. That's also the uh, the ending of the movie, which is also so nonchalant, like. Somehow James Caan didn't die when he fell towards the end of the movie. And then they show him in the courthouse and he's got the limp and he still has plans to, to he's like, no big deal. I'll still kill her and everything else. And then of course his, uh, his buddy from the mob is the limo driver stops on the train tracks, gets crushed by the train. And then Vanessa Williams asks what happened. He just says they caught a train. I had that in my top three. Also, it's just, it was just classic. Those are the lines you wish you could think of. I, I read a great question quote about Arnold when I was looking at this movie and it was Arnold makes the ridiculous seem possible in his roles and it's so true like there's so many things that he does you just like he he pulls out the drill bit from his hand and some other piece of metal from his leg jumps out of a plane and you're just like yeah this seems reasonable he's like a walking lampshade but you never have to really explain much no I mean just because look at him you totally believe that this man can do anything because he's such a physical presence He's, he's like a beast, you know? You're like, what What can't this person, this man do? If anyone can do it, it would be this man. So I believe yes. it. <laughs> he's expanding what I think humanity can do because he's so powerful. Yeah, it's like pre-Captain America without the serum. Like he's the peak right. of human form. <laughs> yep. Wow, yeah, that, that was a, a lot of good choices for one-liners that, as all Arnold movies have. Um but one change to be a blockbuster. What would be your one change to make this a blockbuster? And as usual, this movie was a blockbuster. It crushed and was number one in the in the theaters. But how could it be even more successful? So I had, I had two here. And one, I think, is like a no-brainer. No one would argue with me on this one. And that's, it needed a better poster. I don't know if you've seen the poster for this. It's I like have, gray. It's got Arnold. It's got Vanessa Williams. It says a race around it. But it looks like... It could be a courtroom drama, especially for 1996, especially for Arnold. Put something exciting on there. Like, this is a awesome action movie, and you're giving me the tamest poster ever. How am I supposed to know this is going to be awesome? This is peak poster, peak box cover time. Like, you can you wow people at Blockbuster with these movie posters and the box covers of movies, and it just didn't do it justice. Yeah, I think you, you put a, a killer poster, killer box cover on this. This probably has 95 
uh, for audience score. I think more people are more excited, more into it. It's probably just maybe not enough people saw it. Yeah, probably. And maybe people thought it was a courtroom drama. That's why they didn't. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, people what the hell is this awesome action movie? I wanted a courtroom drama. If they had put a couple rail guns on there and uh, Arnold dodging a plane, you would know a little bit more about what's going to happen in the movie. Yep. And and my other one was just sort of following that. And this is maybe just being selfish because I thought the guns were so cool. I could have used more rail gun. And I know maybe that was just they wanted it to make it a little bit uh, more sparse to make them more special when they did show up on screen. But, I, you know, I could have seen like an alligator getting torched by a rail gun. I could have seen that. I love the idea that your number one pick in the draft was the guns. And your biggest <laughs> problem with this movie is not enough guns. So I love the fact that your love of the, your number one pick could have been even more. You could have loved that even more as a pick if there were just even more guns. Oh yeah, because you know, see them. In the, they make a they make an appearance in the beginning. They obviously make appearance at the end. But there's a while where we don't see them, and I think we we could have. I also like the gun in Arnold's hands. There was a b- couple bozos that were using those guns before that just kept missing. And yep. once Arnold got a hold of them, it was like, no, this is how you use the gun, guys. Yeah. Let me show you how it's done. Oh, right. You put them on your side and you just spray. Yep. Why aren't we spraying? There's no reload and there's no ammunition. <laughs> That's a good one. My one change to be a blockbuster, even though I am a fan and, you know, she's had a couple, she had a couple good hits when she was singing, but. I'm taking Vanessa Williams out of this this role. She, Whoa. It's, Whoa. It's, I know, I know. She's not terrible, but I think during the mid-90s here, there's some other choices that maybe could have been a little bit better. And she was a name, but not like as an actress. She was in some stuff, Fresh Prince of Bel-Air yep. uh, and, uh, and a, a few other things. But she's not like an actress name really at this point. And I think if this had someone, let's see, some ideas at the time, so mid '90s. I think Regina King would have been great in this. A few years after uh, Boys in the Hood, and mm-hmm. I didn't get her due. She didn't get her due in the '90s. She's a phenomenal actress. I thought she would have been great. Um, Angelina Jolie is starting to become a thing here. She did Hackers yep. the year before. Could have easily been in this role. Our girl Sandy. If Sandy was across from Arnold, that would have oh, been a great sure. yep. matchup. There, she's great with computers. We all know that. And I'll throw in Demi Moore. Demi Moore was pretty big at this time too, and I thought she could have done great across from um, from Arnold. It's it's almost like because because Vanessa Williams was obviously she was a big singer at the time. She had was it Miss America, Miss Universe, whatever whatever it was. It's almost like this seemed like it could have been the precipice of a, a huge career for her. And I feel like maybe if she had had that major career that a lot of these other folks actresses had had afterwards i feel like maybe we'd be looking back at it differently and saying like this was this was the role that kickstarted everything but i agree it's sort of like a movie that's this great you kind of want it to have us some more star power in it and i think if, if she had had that career afterwards i somehow think that would have worked better here looking looking back on it but i, <laughs> I agree it sort of didn't it, her, her acting career just didn't really take off no and she got the best Chance of it taking off being put opposite Arnold in a in a super successful action movie. It just didn't work out. Still a great career otherwise, though. Yeah, I mean, and, she and also Miss America, I think, in like '84. So that was like 13 years, 12 years before yeah. this. Pretty impressive. And uh, save the best for last. I mean, that's that's just a banger. Incredible. I listened to yeah. that. I listened to it like three or four times since because it's like when Vanessa Williams comes up, you have to just toss on the song. You have to. It's so good. <laughs> this is pre spinoff, but a little note I had is it's always funny to me when there's like a little subtle thing in movies to show that an actor or actress is attractive. Like someone has to mention it. It's almost like like they have to (laughs) get out. It's like Dante's Peak where the lady had to be like, look, overly look up, you know, look up and down Pierce Brosnan to be like, whoa. And like (laughs) guys with binoculars who were the the, uh, the federal agents are just like, no, tell her she looks good. And like a little linger (laughs) binoculars just to, Tell the audience, like, we all know she's attractive. It's like, all right. Yep. I, it's funny that you're doing this. I love that you're doing it, but it's, it's also just a little over the top. We all we all get it. <laughs> Control yeah, yourself, guys. You're at work. <laughs> yeah, that's great. It's a solid call. All right, spinoff idea. All right, I got, I got two ideas here. One, and this seems obvious, is I could see just, I could see this being a, a, a show. I could see this really taking off. I mean, we 
we sort of got introduced to all these other characters that Arnold had erased in the past, and they all seemed awesome. So I could easily see each one of those being a different episode. And especially this, you know, you, you could do a bunch of different episodes and then have an episode or two at the end of the season where they all sort of come into play and help each other out like they did in this movie. I think that's like instant show right there. Because like everyone who got into this was probably wrapped up in some crazy scenario before that needed Arnold to come in and, and erase them. So they're probably all just as exciting as what happened in this movie. Yeah, I don't know how there isn't like eight seasons of Eraser on NBC. There should be like right? Blacklist or something before Blacklist and just those easily repeatable shows where it's like, I got to erase this person or I got to go back into my prior network of people I've erased and get their help to help erase the next person. Like it's just so, yeah. just turn them out. I also can't believe it's not like a Jason Bourne type thing where there's just like a trilogy of Eraser movies. It's shocking. I didn't see anything out there about that being kicked around and it just never happened. I, I do think they're coming out with sort of a reboot now or in a few months, but I would have thought that back in the 90s, they would have said there was greenlit the next five of these. Maybe it was an Arnold thing because he, he, you know, he obviously carried this movie. And if they couldn't get him, then back then it was, would probably be hard to put out like an Eraser 2 with. Yeah, right. You know, <laughs> with Christian Slater or something like that. Right. <laughs> The other one I thought, uh, and this was just because I, I loved the characters when they did show up, but I could see some sort of show that I, I, I want to see more about Tony Two Toes and his crew running the docks. Those characters, little Mike, all of them, they only pop up at the end, but they do play a critical role. And they do but, pop up at the end. Oh, yeah, <laughs> they do. I just love, I love those characters. I, I wanted to see a little bit more. Obviously, this movie wasn't the right time to see a little bit more, but I could see another you know, give me give me an hour, give me two hours. Let me, let me find out about those guys. Yeah, that's definitely a movie in there. I love that scene when the tractor is picking them up, and all of a sudden the the mobster oh, just get yeah. out of there and spray. Bad guy versus bad guy, awesome. So good. These docks are ours. <laughs> <laughs> this is a maybe a little out there for a spinoff idea. Like maybe this is sort of a spinoff already. So, <laughs> last action hero. Jack Slater, I I referenced this earlier, so I can sort of bring it back to this now. Uh, Jack Slater realized he was a movie star at the end of Last Action Hero and embraced it. You know, he had to go back in the film to get to make his awful wound a flesh wound. If you haven't seen Last Action Hero, this is your chance to go back and watch Last Action Hero. But at that point, he knows he's a movie star. So I feel like he took the role of John Kruger as... Jack Slater playing John Kruger. So he's already in the movie world, which is why everything's a flesh wound. He can get the drill bit through his hand. He can get (laughs) a a huge hunk of metal through his leg. He can fall with a parachute that doesn't open on top of a car, crushes the hood, and he just walks away because it's a flesh wound. No big deal. He just wipes, you know, just brushes it aside. He plays a game of chicken, which is what Jack Slater does in every single movie. And he wins against an airplane. Uh, The bad guys always miss him. When he when he when they shoot at him, uh, he gets the girl at the end. He has a heart of gold, which happened throughout, which evolved throughout that movie of Last Action Hero, where he loves the fact that Vanessa Williams is a true good person and he's a good guy. Great matchup. I just think that this is sort of like a semi meta sequel to like Jack Slater playing a movie the- a movie star. <laughs> oh yeah, I, I love that this. I had to check. I was like, which movie came out first? But I, I love that this came out after Last Action Hero because you're totally right. Like this is this is the movie role that Jack Slater would have played. Like this right. is once he embraces the fact that he's in a uh, he's a movie star. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a perfect role. It's a perfect role for that that character, and it's just great. Like they don't they don't make movies like this now. It, probably in part because there, there's no one else like Arnold. I think Arnold really just nailed this this type of role. Absolutely, this, this those roles. It's it's there's too much information now. There was such like a mystique around Arnold pre-internet. Yep, and you know he was Conan. He's a bodybuilder. No one quite knew how tall he was. Was he seven feet tall or was he five <laughs> ten? They didn't even know. <laughs> so I'm not sure that could even exist anymore. But. Um... Great spinoff ideas. Any notes that we didn't get to? Uh, I did have in my notes, what's the deal with secure lines? I feel like those are in <laughs> movies all the time. And I, like, is that a thing? I mean, it, it must be for the government, but can you just 
like how do you know it's secure? That guy picks up the phone. He's like, okay, go. It's a secure line. Like what I know about the other ways. If you hear a click after you pick up the phone, that's an obvious oh, yeah. one. Definitely not secure. Not secure. Never heard a click, but I would know that it's not secure if I hear that. But you're right. I don't know how you know it's what makes it secure. The guy was calling from a police station. Like they probably record those, right? You would think. Yep. But secure. It's secure. The guy. It's a secure line. Uh, you know this. I don't know if it was nominated or won an Academy Award for Best Sound Effects Editing. I saw that. Yeah, I think it was. Yeah. I, think, I don't. I don't think it won, but it was nominated. So, so it's this an Academy, is a, Award, Academy Award. Totally. Rightly so. Yeah. Uh, which makes sense. The sound effects in the editing of him were incredible. The Daryl character, crazy guy. They broke up oh, three yeah. months before. He's using the key. He's pretending. He's like, oh, I haven't heard from you. He's showering in her house. Yeah, the before. shower. The yeah, shower. Which is like, you have an ex shower in your house and let themselves in. You, an ex from three months ago. Right. You knew. You knew as soon as he came down out of the shower that Daryl did not have long to live. He was, yeah. that was such a, a line that was crossed. You're like, this this person cannot survive. He's, he's got he's, like three minutes tops. He's super excited to open the door because he thinks he's catching her and like cheating on him. When it, right. even if there was a guy at the door, which it was, you know, Arnold the Balloons, it's not cheating anymore, dude. Like you're, it's over. Yeah, you're this gone. You're out of the picture. Picture. But he got the perfect death where he just like got hit with the gun, which was so satisfying and then stuck to the wall. Oh yeah. That was amazing. Because you were just like, Yes. Yes, yeah. that, that that is what should be happening right now. What do you know that actor from? Does anything come to mind for you? Oh, I don't know. He did look familiar, but I couldn't place it. He was in the Cosby show and like uh, Fresh Prince, but I know him from White Man Can't Jump. He worked the Jeopardy lot. It's how Rosie Perez, you know, is that like half court yep. shot or whatever that, yep. um, they had, that Billy had to hit. Solid. Other thing that I liked in the in the film, I loved I loved all the cars Arnold drove. I feel like usually in action movies, people are driving these just badass, ridiculous sports cars, muscle cars, pickup trucks that are just souped up. And here you see him driving station wagons and just beaters of cars. I just I I loved the picture of of Arnold Schwarzenegger driving a station wagon. I just I just thought that was awesome. Him peeling away from the burning house in the station wagon, three people in front. You're right. It's a Great imagery. <laughs> it's just fantastic. And I feel like that was part of like early career. Arnold probably wouldn't have done that. But at this point in his career, he's just he's so in command of his aura that he's like, yeah, I can drive a station wagon and make it look badass. And make it look badass. Exactly. That's really good. I like um, fake mouth to mouth. I'm not sure I've seen fake mouth to mouth before. <laughs> Someone's already dead and you killed them. You <laughs> pretend to be giving them out to mouth. So similar to that, um I thought the reaction to the guy, the fake seizure, but you know, the the security guard did not know it was a fake seizure. Very casual, non nonchalant reaction to this guy foaming at the mouth in his presence. He was just like, oh great, this guy. <laughs> they were so annoyed with him anyway, they're just like, oh, this yep. is gonna be even longer that he's here now that he's dying. <laughs> Last one, I think, is uh, was there any other song in the 90s that they would play to show that you were in a gay environment than Raining Men? I feel like that's the only song that could ever be played. Maybe uh, maybe YMCA. Maybe. YMCA, for sure. That, that that could do it. But it's Raining Men. It's just like, all right, this, watch out. Hit warning, everyone. There's going to yeah. be some gay people here. Yeah, right. <laughs> I guess, you know, back then, I guess they felt they needed to make make some sort of audible warning for people to <laughs> get know, ready, deal with it somehow. Oh, I guess last thing, too. The one flaw of the uh, the railgun, refrigerators. Can't. Yes. Can't see, true. Can't see refrigerators. <laughs> very, very true. And but we know from uh, the fourth Indiana Jones movie, the, the Crystal Skull one, uh, a refrigerator can stop a nuclear explosion. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll cut the railgun some slack on that one. That's that's a great point. I didn't even consider that. I kind of wiped that. I'll wipe that away then. <laughs> <laughs> All right. That was awesome. Yeah, what do we have up next? Next episode, we have The Strangers with uh, Liv Tyler, Scott Speedman, and a bit of a cameo from Glenn Howerton of Always Sunny. But uh, a, a sort of a creepy horror movie uh, that was that I really liked. And I, I think they're planning on having... Uh, more come out recently, but it's from 2008, and I really don't understand how it cracks our list. 
but it does. Yeah, I don't I don't think I've seen this. It sounds so familiar, but I, I think I've seen a number of other movies that sort of sound similar, but I don't actually think I've seen this one. So the, the Liv Tyler piece of it threw me. I was like, I don't remember her her being in one of these. So I'm excited yeah, to see it. It just, it just sneaks under 48% and 48%. So wow, barely makes it. I'm glad it does, though. All right, yeah, that was a lot of fun, and uh, see you next week. Or yeah, next later. Later. <laughs>